Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Paradigm Shifts podcast with your host, Keisha Kruger. I'm an organization development practitioner and executive coach working with leaders to create positive changes in the workplace using behavioral science. My personal mission, share science-based tools and leadership insights from the field that you can use in the workplace and beyond. Considering we spend about three quarters of our lifetime at work, there is incredible science and organizational psychology that could be used to rethink the way we work, lead, and ultimately live. Join me as I speak with thought leaders and business leaders in practice, unpacking light bulb moments for paradigm shifts. Hello, everyone. On this week's episode, I had such a pleasure of speaking with Don Ream, the CEO of E3 Solutions, an employee engagement tech company that allows organizations to build engaged, high-performance cultures. Now, what's so cool about this episode is that you can hear the big-time nerd coming out in both of us. When Don and I connected for the first time, we realized very quickly that we had such an alignment on our vision and our mission and the impact that we want to make here on the on this planet. And I'm so excited for you to learn more. Reem focuses on using neuroscience and behavioral science-backed research to consult with leaders in the public, private, and nonprofit spaces. He is a former science advisor to Congress and the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And he shares a grounded and empirically validated methodology to get employees more engaged and better positioned for success targeted at the bottom line. He is a leading speaker and author and lectures on employee engagement throughout North America and Europe, helping thousands of CEOs understand the key drivers of exceptional workplace behavior. His Forbes book publication, Thrive by Design, the neuroscience that drives high performance cultures, lays out the neurological underpinnings of human behavior that distinguish Don's company from conventional leadership consulting. As a two-time featured TEDx speaker, Don presented some of his most popular content in Can Work Save Our Relationships at TEDx BYU and How to Stay Ahead of the Future of Work at TEDx Warrington. I am so excited for you to tune into this episode. Feel free to visit the show notes for more information about Don, his services, and how to be in touch. Hi, Don. How are you? Hi. I'm doing really well. I hope you are too. Very well. And I am so excited to have you here today to talk about engagement and neural science. Well, I hope you I hope you get a, a, a bigger audience than just us for this because it is kind of a narrow and special topic, but I'm certainly excited about it. It is, but such an important one and you're doing such important work and I can't wait for, for everyone else to hear about it. So I want to start here. In your book, Thrive by Design, you share a study by the Gallup organization that estimated about 70% of the factors that influence employee engagement are owned by managers. Uh -huh. So from your perspective, why is it that the man it's the manager's responsibility to create conditions where people look forward to coming to work? Yeah. So uh, there's so much talk in the, in the popular leadership literature about the role of culture. You know, people say culture is king, culture trumps strategy. And I just, a lot of focus on that, that big notion of culture. But actually, the, the culture writ large across the, the whole organization doesn't have that much of an impact on daily behavior. But here's how I describe culture to, to our clients. You do have a culture writ large across the whole organization, determined in large part by legacy issues with, with the leaders or the brand, uh, public perceptions of the brand. But then in every location or department, you have a subculture that's largely determined by the person that has the most control over that entity. But then, and this is the most important part of culture, there are micro cultures under every manager. And it's that micro culture that has the, the, the largest, most significant impact on employees' daily behavior. Now, I want to finish that thought. Am I saying that the larger culture is irrelevant? No. But the most important part of that larger notion of culture across the organization is in how it influences manager behavior, not employee mm -hmm. behavior, although that's important. But how does it how does it help managers understand how they are supposed to perform their jobs as leaders within the organization? Um, and there's just there's not just the Gallup study, but for example, in exit interviews. Uh, there was one study that, that showed that 85 percent of employees who voluntarily terminated stated as one of the primary reasons they quit was their relationship with their immediate manager or supervisor. Uh -huh. um, there's an old saying uh, that employees join companies, they quit managers. And it's absolutely uh -huh. true. 
So managers then have a responsibility to create the conditions that people look forward to. Yeah. And, and this is and this is the hard part. They haven't been taught how to do it. Um, mm. they, they got the managerial title and, and raise in their salary, but they didn't get any new portfolio of skills. And this is one, one of the most challenging things in organizations is you, you elevate people from what they were typically very competent at doing, and you put them in a position of incompetence because now their primary job is leading adults, not doing what they used to do. Uh, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not blaming managers here per se, um, but they do have to take more responsibility for increasing their own skill set. They can't wait around for the senior leaders at the top to help them do it. They need to take the initiative to make that shift from being a manager to a leader. Yeah, that's such an important initiative to take and a shift to yeah. go from managing your own individual contributor work to then being responsible for managing a team and helping a team reach their goals. Yes. So what, in your opinion, helps managers take that accountability shift or where in an or what's missing in an organization or could be put forth in an organization to help managers shift to that accountability culture? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, we have we offer clients a master class in engagement and retention for their managers. So that's one of the things we do for our clients. We don't just measure engagement across the whole organization. It's really it's actually unfair to measure engagement and, and hey. show results by manager if you then don't come in and give the managers new skills. Um, uh. If if managers don't have a leadership structure that provides that kind of training. Um, they're going to have to really do it on their own. And, and tens of thousands do. They go out and they buy these leadership books that are out there, which are probably personally inspiring. But, you know, there are more than a thousand books in print today on leadership. Very few of them are actually based on science. Um, and so they have very limited utility. And, and what I mean by that is we've had two decades of thousands of books on leadership. And yet the number of employees reporting being engaged when they get to work is, is actually declined. So it's just we we need to we need to take a science based approach. Is and so they, I, I would encourage managers to focus on the science. Um, and and neuroscience has now really helped us see what needs to be done. Yeah, and neuroscience, where does that play in the role of management? Yeah, it it needs to take a much more important role. It, it is interesting that. You see organizations use science in many ways, in their financials, in, in their uh, production policies. Um, they just, they, they and, and in materials. And, but when it comes to the science of what we know drives exemplary human behavior, most organizations are a couple decades behind the science. This is a huge opportunity for organizations. One of the last untapped reservoirs of increased productivity and retention and engagement is a simple understanding of what neuroscience now tells us is at the core of what the brain needs to do in order, the, the conditions, the environment the brain needs to be in in order to operate at close to its full capacity. Uh, so let's talk about those conditions. What is required to have a condition or an environment for an employee to feel good and look forward to coming to work? What does that look like? Yeah, so we we, we need to go back again to the science of what we know about homo sapiens. Um, every person on the planet wakes up with the same agenda at a subconscious level. Um, and, and understanding that agenda is key because if organizations can create this environment the brain's been looking for literally every day since birth, people thrive. And, and that's why I, I titled the book Thrive by Design, the, the mm -hmm. neuroscience that drives high-performance cultures. If we, we know what the design is where people uh, are most likely to thrive. Once we know that, why wouldn't every leader and manager want to move in that direction? And that's that's the point that we make in our practice. I love that because if we already have the science, to your point, why are we not utilizing yeah. it? And I love the other uh, comment you made about how leaders are using science for, you know, meeting financial metrics yeah. and, you know, our KPIs and quality initiatives. But when it comes to the 
human capital assets, right? The individuals who are driving the business and doing the work. Why are we not utilizing the science for that? Yeah. So critical. Yeah. So talk to me about engagement. What is engagement and what is the misnomer between engagement and satisfaction? Because uh, in my experience, yeah. I've seen a lot of companies measure satisfaction yeah. or even in a hybrid with engagement. And I think it's important that we make the distinction now, here. Uh, it's a really good point. Uh, there is an enormous difference between employee satisfaction and employee engagement. Satisfaction is an attitude, very ephemeral, can change overnight, and it's not predictive of what the individual will do next. But employee engagement is a behavior. And so we are measuring behaviors that we know drive engagement. There, there's another thing out there in the popular leadership literature right now about happiness and people being happy. And of course, I want people to be happy. It would be ridiculous not to want that. But when organizations start with that as the entry point, they go astray uh, because mm -hmm. now they're trying to figure out what are all these ways we need to make people happy. And then they ask them what would make you happy. And it's just this market basket of things that really won't move the needle much um, mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, any new uh, perk that you give to people uh, or benefit uh, immediately becomes an entitlement. So perks and benefits actually don't generate a lot of uh, uh, new behavior after the fact. Um, we we want to measure conditions that we know allows people to be happy. Let me state it this way. If someone is engaged when they're at work, they're happy. It's an outcome. It, it's uh -huh. not the front door you go through. It, it's a part of which you get after entry uh, when you do it well. Um most of the what, what are called engagement surveys out there today are actually employee satisfaction surveys. And they ask employees, how satisfied or happy are you with this, that, or the other? I wouldn't touch them. And, and <laughs> part of the reason, not only is it the, you know, wrong to just measure sentiment because that changes and shifts, but also if you regularly ask your employees a series of questions about how satisfied they are, they begin to think that the role of management is to make them happy. And I, I, so you're enabling that that attitude towards yes. the workplace right from the, the beginning. Yes, and and I just I just wouldn't do that. It just it, it does not help. It, it's just really interesting, and it and I I won't go into to the issues around comp and benefits and their correlation to daily behavior, other than to say it's very very small, if anything. Uh, and and the reason that's the case is because the part of the brain that determines how we behave during the day has no concept of currency. None. Now, uh, it has a very acute uh, uh, radar, if you will, on fairness and equity. So the, the real role of uh, the powerful role and, and influencing daily behavior is around fairness and equity. And so if pay is an issue that falls below that threshold, that is, I'm not paid a fair and equitable wage, then it becomes very important. But I think most managers out there if, if there, if it's a manager listening to this call, I would pose this question to you. If you gave every employee in the organization a 20% raise tomorrow, would you see a 20% increase in their productivity and engagement? Uh, and when I do ask that uh, in front of managers, they all immediately start shaking their head no. That's the issue. Employees are always asking for more money, and they and maybe they deserve it. I'm not arguing that point. But giving people more money does not automatically deliver more engaged and more productive employees. Now, they might yeah. be happier, but um, uh, they, they are not automatically more engaged and productive. And so what we're looking for in our practice are, are non-coercive ways, uh, non-monetary ways of increasing discretionary effort. And now I'm, I'm finally going to answer your question about what is employee engagement. We define it very simply. As employee engagement is an employee's willingness to freely give discretionary effort to their employer. Man. And what I mean by that is every employee knows what level of effort they have to bring when they come to work so that a manager, another manager, someone doesn't tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, what's up with you today? So they all know yeah. this universal level of behavior that they have to bring to the workplace. But every single one of them has an additional level of effort that represents what they're fully capable of doing as a human being. And the difference between what someone is capable of doing and what they typically do when they get to work 
That delta is what we refer to as discretionary effort. And there are two things about it that should be really important to managers. One, every employee comes to work every day with discretionary effort. That they, they, even if it's, you know, w- whether it's in bricks and mortar or they're working at their kitchen table, they begin the day with the ability to do it. The second issue is they can only volunteer it to you. You can't force discretionary effort out of someone. They have to want to do it. And so the, the key thing here for managers is to create the conditions where employees are most likely to volunteer their discretionary effort. And, and that's, that's really the key. Um, and, and it's really up to managers to, to do the heavy lifting to create those conditions. Wow. I mean, that just brings it full circle now and helps paint the bigger picture here of the true responsibility that managers have. And, and it is a heavy lifting job. So who supports the managers? <laughs> uh, sadly, usually that uh, no one uh, seems sadly. to be the, the bigger picture. Um, look, managers, what, what we have found out is that managers are kind of um, kind of burned out. Um, yeah. They've been through a lot of leadership training. They're they're told it's about grit, or it, it's about accountability, or it's about one buzzword after another. So they're they're pretty burned out about this whole thing. Um, but when you can come to them and say, "Look, science is here to help," and if you do, let's say these three things, this is what you should see happen. And and lo and behold, when they do those three things, it it does happen. See, we're, we're not asking managers to do something like push a boulder uphill. Um, employees are hardwired at birth to be engaged in a group. That is the default position of the human brain, is to be engaged productively with others. And that's and so it, we're, we're not trying to get people to do things that, that isn't natural. But if managers wait for senior leaders to show them the way, this is going to take a long, long time. Um, because what, at least what we find among our clients, um, it's not that, well, so many leaders are, uh, were, were, were created in the, in the pre pandemic, uh, management style and management theory, I have to tell you is it's just really bereft of, uh, what some of these right things to do are. Uh, and it's just, it's a shame. I look, Management theory was created by old, privileged white men like me. And what did we try to keep out of the workplace for a couple hundred years? Emotion. Uh, uh, that was, that's inappropriate. It doesn't belong in the workplace. You can do that at home or on your own time, but yeah, no emotion in the workplace. The op- so, Don, are you saying we need to bring emotion into the workplace? Oh, my gosh. That, this, is the, this is the ultimate irony. Emotion, it turns out to be the key pivotal point on whether or not you can create a high performance culture where people are engaged. You have to understand the role of emotion in the human brain if you want to create a high performance culture. Now, I'm not talking about happy, sad, weeping, crying, but I'm talking about this deep understanding that we now have about the role of emotion in the brain. Virtually all human behavior originates in the emotional centers of the brain. And we need to come alongside that fact and understand what is it that emotion wants and needs in order to thrive. This is where I struggle because I, I recognize over my, the last few years, (laughs) more often in the last year, that the way that we treat our environments in business and work is so separate from the way that we treat our relationships at home. (laughs) and the individuals that we, the domains yeah. outside of the workplace, right? And so what I'm hearing you say is humans are humans. The science is still the same regardless of the context that you're in. And so leveraging relational, emotional intelligence, relationships, whether it's in a domain outside of the workplace or it's within the workplace, this the stuff still means the same thing, right? Oh, abs- absolutely. You're just, you're spot on. Uh, human beings are relational creatures at birth. We're, we're actually, um, uh, we're actually herd animals, hardwired to be in a group, which is a really good thing for business, by the way. Uh, but we're relational creatures. And when we are amidst what, what clinicians would call safe and secure attachments, what you and I might call in a casual conversation, trusted colleagues, um, Social neuroscientists refer to them as reliable social resources, which is what other people would be to us. 
but the brain is is starving for reliable social resources or safe and secure connections. This was the topic of my first uh, TED talk, and and to to say that these relationships aren't important in the workplace is just delusional. Uh, the brain only has one limbic system, which is where this emotional processing takes place. And the limbic system in the human brain has no idea if it's at work or at home. It's just incapable, really, um, uh, of making that that distinction. Now, it does know, and it's acutely aware and sensitive to whether or not it feels safe. And and when it feels safe, uh, the brain can perform at close to its full capacity. When it doesn't feel safe, um, it literally steals metabolic capacity from other regions of the brain, including our prefrontal cortex, which me- which makes us less capable to accomplish tasks. It's so interesting and fascinating to me because if, let's say, for example, someone is out there dating and they're trying to build relationships and find someone that they can you know, be compatible yes. with, whether it's a romantic or even a friendship yes. relationship, a lack of emotional availability would be a reason why you wouldn't partner or couple with that person, oh, right? Oh. And so when you think about the experiences you have with the relationships and individuals within the workplace, if there is a lack of emotional availability and presence there, you're likely not going to, you're going to shut it down, right? Or you're going to feel a cognitive dissonance between who you are and that re- that resonance and coherence with the other individual yeah. and that team. And so you wouldn't like to belong or feel like you're included in that environment and you likely would see yourself out, right? Just like if you were in a relationship or trying to date, you would see yourself out if that wasn't available to you. Yes. Um, so it's so interesting. The dynamics are so parallel, mm. but for some reason, as you've mentioned, kind of the evolution of the workplace over time, we've shut out the importance of the human brain and the needs that we have. Yeah, we, we, you know, in economists, I think this is a horrible phrase, but economists early on uh, started referring to people as human capital. And yeah. when you look at the early uh, economics literature, the employees were, were literally viewed um, as, as parts in a process. They, they were just, they're like a machine part. Um, and if the part didn't work, you just threw it out and got another one. And that's really the, the basis of which uh, modern industry was developed since in the 250 years since the Industrial Revolution. And you could treat people that way under one condition. There had to be an abundance of labor. Mm. There had to be lots of people. And, and so back in those days, if, if a company, look, and I come from a manufacturing industrial family. Some people listening might have Rheem water heaters or Rheem heaters or air conditioners. My grandfather was the founder of Rheem. And I have all these pictures of, of, the, um, uh, of, the, of the hiring office at, at Rheem plants around the world. And there were always a long line of people hoping to get a job. Uh, uh. You know, you, you have a job opening and, and 50, 100 people show up. So you could just toss people if they couldn't bear the conditions. But the, those days are gone. Uh, uh-huh. We're, we're going to be living amidst a tight labor market, probably in perpetuity, in large part because the U.S. population is leveling out. Uh, 2021, the U.S. population only grew by one-tenth of one percent, the slowest increase in our population since the country was founded. And it's going to flatten. And it's not going to take too long. And, and another 15 years or so, maybe 20 at the most, um, the only increase in, in our population in the United States will be from immigrants. So in, in this context of tightening labor, we can't treat people the way we did before. And here's the rub for managers. And this is where it really gets challenging, I think, for them. For the first time in the history of business, managers now have to learn how to create the conditions where employees look forward to coming to work. And if managers can't learn that skill, it's going to be harder and harder for them to hold on to people. And eventually, leadership, senior leadership, is going to see those managers as liabilities. Now, hopefully, they will train them. Uh, but many organizations don't pause to do that because that training isn't a line item in the budget and they don't think they can afford it. They'd rather just try to plug in a new manager, that same old style of discover, okay. kick to the curb, that which doesn't seem to be working, and see if you can plug in a new part. That process, that the companies that still do it that old way are, are going to find it very, very difficult 
to find high quality talent and to stay competitive. There's, there's a thread that I've heard through a couple of our discussions here is that even when it comes to like the employee showing up and putting in discretionary effort freely and the managers taking the initiative to create that condition, it's willingness. It's willingness on both parties. Yeah. Both sides have to have that willingness yeah. to show up and put in the effort on their behalf to make it a better environment to for from both sides, right? Well, then it goes back to what you were saying about emotional availability, whether it's in a, in, a, in a relationship, friendship, intimate relationship, but managers have to be emotionally available. Uh, yeah. That is it's what we refer to as emotional Velcro. There has to be emotional Velcro between the employees and the company and hopefully their immediate leader and, and other leaders up the food chain as well. But managers have to be emotionally vul uh, vul uh, available. What does that mean? They need to be vulnerable. They yeah. need not to think like or act like they have all the answers all the time. They need to ask for help. They need to ask for advice. They need to be more collaborative and inclusive in the way they make decisions. Um, and they certainly need to be emotionally available to say, wow, I'm really proud of what you did. I, I'm, I, I really feel good about what we accomplished here. When we look at the 28 questions that we ask in our, um, uh, in our employee engagement survey, which is called Culture ID, when you look at the global data, we see that the, the lowest scoring uh, uh, elements are around recognition, feedback, and validation. And oh. Every human being on the planet wakes up in search of validation. Do you see me? Sure. Do you know me? Do you value me? In intimate relationships, it's do you have my back? Can I count yeah. on you? And there's some of that in the workplace as well. And, and when the answers to those questions, yes, I have your back. Yes, I, I know what you need. Yes, I'm going to be there for you in times of need, whether it's at home or at work. That creates emotional Velcro. And employees that are in that kind of environment, especially if that manager created it, they'll walk through a wall for that leader. I mean, they'll do anything for that person. It's funny. But managers that are cold, unavailable, even their, down to their face having what's called a flat affect. I think yeah. in the social media is referred to as a resting bored face. I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, but clinically, it's, the, the, it's this flat affect. And managers like that, it, they're, just, they're just repelling people. Um, so we, we do have to be real people, whole people at work. So do managers. And employees need to be seen as a whole person. The, out, out of the 20 things we ask, one thing is head and shoulders above the others, correlating with someone who is what we would call actively engaged at work. And here's the statement. I feel valued for more than just the work I produce. I feel, oh. I feel valued for more than just the work I produce. Our, the actively engaged employees in our global data are 89% more likely to agree with that statement than the disengaged employees. It's just a really important factor. Uh, and, and this is why uh, I, I think, you know, leaders need to be focusing more on collecting good data like Culture ID, our product provides, because it really gives key insights into which skill sets really need to be bolstered uh, in the manager core. Mm. I, I'm so looking forward to reviewing your tool because I'm a big science nerd. I've shared with with you and, and we've been nerding out a little bit about neuroscience and engagement now. Um, but when it comes to, like you said earlier, when it comes to measuring what matters, measuring engagement, it doesn't make sense to do it if you're not going to be building the capabilities or the skills within your management team to be able to pull on those levers, right? Yes. And that's when I go, when we go back to the, the engagement versus satisfaction, I feel like satisfaction is missing those levers that drive human behavior. So yeah. if we're going to then measure the, the human behaviors and those levers within an engagement um, sphere, then we need to train our managers on how to actively insert those levers and different things. Yes. So when it comes to leaders or organizations making sure that they have the right training, what does that look like? Well, um, we have been talking to the prefrontal cortex of employees for centuries. That is the thinking right. conscious part of the brain right here behind the skull plate. What we try to teach managers to do is to talk directly to the limbic system. Uh, because Same. the limbic system is, is, again, the part of the brain that determines people's behavior during the day. Um, 
the, the key penultimate question uh, for us that we, we tell our clients is this, what does it feel like to work here? What does it feel like to work here? The answer to that question is the true culture of that, that team, that department, or that company. The felt experience of being at work is absolutely essential to understand and to support and to grow. And uh, I just, I would just encourage, I mean, that's why I, I wrote the book. I wanted to give managers insights in, into this just absolutely breathtaking advancements in social neuroscience that helps us understand what, what the brain has been seeking literally every day since birth. It, as a part earlier in my career, when I was doing an, another type of work, I, I worked with about 150 scientists at the Human Genome Institute at the National Institutes of Health. And one of the things that I learned from them are all of these things that are in the human genome. We don't just inherit, you know, uh, light, you know, balding heads in old age and, and brown eyes. We, we also inherit an operating system, a blueprint, if you will, of that just contains all kinds of insights, including uh, insights from previous generations. Uh, this is how we understand, for example, that trauma can be generational. Trauma can be passed down through generations. The genome holds on to that. And so we we just we've learned so much about it over the last decade. Uh, business needs to come alongside these new understanding, and yes. and put it to work in the workplace. And that's that's everything we do. So we we did it in a book. Uh, we do it in a survey tool. We give workshops based on that science. And then for managers, we also have uh, a website, managerresourcecenter.com that also provides very actionable tools and things on how and how to do this well. Um, I, can't, I did come from, from an industrial manufacturing family, but I was the black sheep in the ring family. I'm not trained Good. in business. I'm trained as a biologist and ecologist, and I see companies as social ecosystems. And I wish more leaders would see the company as a social ecosystem and, and, and be more concerned and thoughtful and intentional about how uh, to provide the right nutriments to that ecosystem so it can thrive. I'm kind of laughing thinking about the question. It's such an important question that you had said, what does it feel like to work here? And the reason I'm laughing, let me explain myself, is because I have been told time and time again that if you want to get engagement or buy, you know, stakeholder buy-in um, at the executive level, especially if it's a male-dominated level, then you need to ask the question, think, what do you think about yeah. this instead of feel, right? Because that's how they're going to hear you. And you may shut them down by asking questions around feelings and you need to shift it to thought. And what I'm hearing is that's so counterintuitive to the way we work as human yeah. beings. So how do leaders show up in an environment in the way that we're supposed to embracing this emotional availability when there are other leaders who are pushing against the grain yeah. that are um, maybe not embraced and not available yeah. emotionally. It, it is interesting. Look, thinking is, is absolutely vitally important. And 15 years ago, I would have also said that thinking determines human behavior because that's all that really science could tell us. Um, what, what we now know, the world's leading researcher on the role of emotion in the brain says it this way, that the prefrontal cortex is the servant to the limbic system. So thinking is important, but we used to think that thinking came first and then feelings resulted from it. Now that whole paradigm has been shifted, uh, which has been rough for a lot of fields of psychotherapy. Um, but we, we now know that virtually all thinking uh, uh, is, it is driven by the role of emotion. And, and, the, and the limbic system has what's called control precedence in the brain. But yes, leaders need, this is a, just a tough question. What does it feel like to work here? But it's really important because, let me state it this way, with labor tightening, and it's going to continue to do so oh, at least over the next two decades until AI actually works. With labor tightening, which, which means salaries and benefits are all going to start to get within a narrow range as companies have to go there in order to keep their people. At the end of the day, one of the last differentiators between one employer and another is going to be the felt experience of working there. Yep. And and so you've seen the numbers. Uh, more than 4 million Americans have been quitting their jobs every month since April of 2021. Uh, virtually a third of the American workforce has quit over the last 18 months. Uh, but what's interesting, one of the interesting things about that data is that about 40% of those employees are already looking for new work. 
this isn't about just working somewhere else. It's it's about working in a place that feels right. And I, from a from a brain based perspective, I would say that feels safe. Yeah. So we help clients create what we refer to as a safe haven environment, not a coddling zone, but a place where the limbic system feels safe because when it does, it the brain is then enabled to perform at its highest levels. And this this means doing two key things to, to create a safe haven environment. For example, just to make this very practical, consistency and predictability trump yeah. almost everything, including positivity, uh, as creating an environment that feels safe uh, for, for the brain. Um, the, the brain is constantly trying to figure out the future and map your future. It's a little bit like, what's next? And and if the limbic system knows what's coming next, it feels safe. And if it doesn't know, it doesn't feel safe. And it, and it hijacks resources to deal with that felt sense of risk or danger. Um, so we want managers to be consistent and predictable in how they show up in their demeanor. Uh, another example of doing that would be to have a Monday morning huddle to talk about what's going to happen that week. Another example of, of, of mapping out what's next would be to, to sit down with an employee and map out their career trajectory in the organization. Here's what's next for you in your career. So, I mean, yeah. these are some of the things that we teach managers in, in the master class um, to do. And it, it, it just talks directly to the limbic system. Another condition that is paramount is, uh, I'm, is knowing, do you see me? Am I valued? Yeah. And this is where actions inside the organization, especially for managers around validation, recognition, and feedback are so critically important. These aren't gratuitous social gestures. These are hardwired needs by the brain to be seen and valued. And I just um, was just reviewing uh, a company that I'll be debriefing them on their survey results uh, this afternoon and just looking at the data and it's almost as if recognition is forbidden <laughs> in, in the organization because the employees are just starving for it. Um, and it, it's just, it, and, the, and the interesting thing for me is that these things are free to the organization to do. These, this isn't creating a, an engaged culture is not about spending a lot of money. It's about being intentional and focused. And organizations could do this if they just wanted to and set out to. In other words, we want to create environments where we have regulated nervous systems, yeah. right? We're not going into work what? just wondering and, and kind of having an uncertain future, uncertain present. I love the way that you frame it, that these are, it's not, these are not luxury items. No. They are hardwired needs of the human yeah. body. And so can we just get along with that already? Yeah. <laughs> Move yeah. on. And, and it's interesting. We, we, we have organizations that have been with us now for over nine years. Their their employee engagement levels are now in the 90th percentiles, um, mm. which is really hard to do because our scoring, I think, is the toughest in the industry. Uh, it works. Uh, our average client increases engagement, and over their first four years, an average of 11% each year engagement goes up. And the number wow. of A players... Uh, the, what we call the actively engaged increases by over 50%. It's just remarkable. And and I'll tell you, it isn't us. It's the science. Uh, uh. All we're doing is taking this empirically validated research, primarily from the social science, social neuroscience, and behavioral science, and making it actionable inside the workplace. Because uh, you can't just talk theory if the people you're talking to can't then apply it systemically and in systems inside the organization. That's really key. A couple things I want to come back to. Um, so the first one is I, I already hear individuals in my head, like just things, thoughts that I can see bubbling up. Um, you know, when we have managers who are not willing to show up in this way, even after an organization is potentially creating the, the giving the ingredients that are needed right. to create this culture, um, what do we do with those managers, right? When it comes to culture of accountability, do we let them stay in those positions or do we let them out of the organization? Because you said something about A players and I feel that it's important to um, talk about the importance of accountability in the culture and how if we do not um, create an environment where A players will stay, 
then we'll continue to have um, feed and reinforce B players, C or D players. Yeah. So one of the ways that we deliver the engagement results from Culture ID is by manager. And so leaders will have a list of the managers whose teams are 100% engaged, and then there's almost always managers with teams that are 100% disengaged. The, the role is to go in and, and to support those managers, point out their strengths, point out their opportunities, and then give them, and, 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 and now they have 28 variables where they know what they need to work on. Then you give them some time, like six months, and then you measure that team again to see if they've moved the needle. Uh, and okay. most do, but some don't. Some don't think they need to, some just don't want to, which is usually a fear-based response. Uh, and so you may have to go to really some executive coaching, like one-on-one -on -one an executive coach works with this manager. But at the end of the day, if the manager is unwilling or incapable, it's either an issue of competency or capacity. Let me say it that way. If it's competency, it? they can train and they can do it differently. If it's capacity, no amount of training poured into that vessel is going to change the results. And so you do need to probably move them out of a leadership position and look, these are not bad people. Unfortunately, in business today, one of the only ways you can advance in the organization is to be a manager, which means you have to have people under you. So we force these really brilliant people to have to lead teams of other adults, and it's just not their strength. So can we find a way to elevate these people in the organization in terms of titles and salary without making them lead others? And that yeah. is a huge avenue of opportunity in some organizations. I don't want to fire and, these managers. I, I, just right. want to, I want to put them in the right place, the right seat on the bus. Right. Because if they're in the wrong seat on the bus, then they go from A players to they downgrade, right? Because they would be A players in if they're technical experts, let's say, as an individual contributor. So is there science behind selecting the right people to manage others? Yeah. The, the only way... Uh, to hire using science is to use psychoanalytic testing. And you can, there are some really good uh, tests out there to determine whether or not someone is suitable for a specific position. Um, okay. But we don't just rely on on, on the traditional psychoanalytic tests. We, we also love the Enneagram, which is a yeah. centuries old methodology for determining uh, where someone fits uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a circle, if you will, of nine primary personality types. Um, and that really helps us understand one person's strengths versus, versus another. For example, someone who's a one on the Enneagram, their world is black and white. There's no gray. It's either right or wrong. You either did what you were going to do or you didn't. And, and understanding what, what ones need in order to succeed, both with the leader above them and what they expect of the people below them, is different than a three on the Enneagram, which is what I am, which is where I'm very focused on work and accomplishing things. And I'll even put work ahead of family, which is not healthy. But uh -huh. it, it's reading about a three on the Enneagram helped me understand myself and, and how I work and interact with others in the company. So th there's a range of things you can do, um, but I wouldn't guess anymore. I would use psychoanalytic testing to, to give me some actual true insight. But if, if we can do a better job of hiring people and putting them in the right spot at the beginning, um, that's going to accrue great benefits, both to that individual and then the people that have to report to them. Yeah. And thank you so much. Um, if any, anyone wants to know more about the four pillars of engagement, can you just quickly rattle that off Well, there's, there's, there's four pillars to what we do. First, everything has to be based on empirically validated research, not someone's experience, uh, when someone says, in my 20 years, I've learned that I run. So I, I want it based on empirically validated research, not someone's limited observation skills. Uh, I, I want to measure because you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, I want to provide training to impre improve their skills. So this is where the workshops and training is, is so important. Uh, and then the fourth pillar of what we do is, uh, again, the managerresourcecenter.com a location, a resource that managers can find 24-7, 365. Managers often need help on Sunday evening as they're getting ready for a big meeting on Monday, and, and they can't get it. They're, they're just left empty. So it's really important yeah. to give managers tools to allow them to improve. Great. That sounds amazing. Final question that I ask all my guests, what's the most recent paradigm shift that you've experienced? The, the paradigm shift I've experienced is when leaders understand the role of emotion 
and what they need to do inside their organization. And it's primarily around focusing on healthy relationships. And they often say, Don, I've, I've always, I mean, I've always known this. This feels like common sense to me. And this is what we're constantly telling them. It is common sense because it's the way human beings were organized. But sadly, common sense is not common practice in most organizations. Oh. And that's oh. all we need to start doing. Mm, thank you, because that brings awareness to it. And now we can choose a different outcome. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for all of the insights well, and all of the knowledge and everything that you've mentioned will be linked well, to the show Well, thank notes. you very much for your insights. And you're, you're creating this program to, to, to make these kinds of insights available to people more broadly. You do great work. You're, you're a, a unique talent um, in your understanding of the role of science. And I really appreciate that in you. Thank you. That is such a compliment. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to leave a review, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening. If you know a business leader in practice or friend who you think would be interested in this episode, please consider sharing it with them. I'm so grateful for your support. For more updates, you can follow us at Paradigm Shifts Podcast on Instagram. See you on the next episode.